Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are a passenger aboard a submarine, making its last peaceful voyage across the sea. While unknown to you, the captain has a plan, which, if it succeeds, will mean for you and the entire crew a fate from which there can be no escape. So listen now as Escape brings you Marianne Mosner and Francis Rosenwald's exciting story, The Log. When I was a cub reporter, my boss told me, be there. Don't let your own emotions color your story. Stick to the facts. So these are the facts. This is the way it happened. I met Captain Jan Zabados in a Scandinavian port. During the last war, he'd been in command of a submarine, the only sub of a nation that fought the dictators side by side with the Allies. When he was finally forced into this neutral port, the captain preferred internment to surrender. After that, his nation went out of the business of being a nation. He was left behind with his ship, unwanted by the Allies, and a burden to the government that had become his permanent host. To pay for the vessel's berth and maintenance, the authorities turned her into a tourist's exhibit, permitting her skipper to stay aboard as caretaker and tourist guide. We met during one of those guided tours. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the tour of the SS Seagull, a great ship with a peerless war record. It was my honor and privilege to guide her across hostile waters as master of this man of war that gave battle to the last torpedo. Uh, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. You are very welcome, all. And this way, if you please. You got a few minutes, Captain? I'm Bill Rawlins, New York Globe. I enjoyed your tour a lot. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rawlins. Always glad to talk to gentlemen of the press. I presume you would like to write a story on the seagull. Well, to be honest about it, sir, I'd rather write about her skipper. <laughs> I am honored, but without the seagull, you won't have much of a story. She and I are comrades in arms. The war has been over a long time, Captain. Yes, yes, of course. Haven't you ever thought of going home? Mr. Rollins, this is my home and always will be. As we walked across the deck... The seagull came to life the way her skipper talked about her exploits at sea. And I saw 1,500 tons of steel that had never faltered, never failed. I was busy taking notes when the man came up the gangplank, stocky, brisk, dressed in a natty gray suit, a briefcase under his arm. How do, gentlemen? <sighs> where, uh, where do I find the man in charge? I'm in command of the Seagull, Captain Jan Shabados. What can I do for you? The name's Andrews, here's Picard. I represent the Liverpool office of the Marine Salvage and Surplus Corporation. Do you mind if I look around? The next tour of the Seagull commences at 16 o'clock. That's fine, you go right ahead. I know my way around ships, bought and sold them all my life. This is my first sight. I'm afraid you must be mistaken, sir. The Seagull is not for sale. Uh, not anymore. My company just bought her. I closed the deal yesterday. No, this can't be. Nobody has authority to sell my ship. The government has, according to international law. This, this isn't your ship anymore, Captain. Now, do you realize what it costs this country to keep her docked here? I suppose I, I knew that this was going to happen. Excuse me, sir, what does your company plan to do with the seagull? Scrap her. What else is she good for? Yes, of course. What else is she? 
You plan to break her up here? No, no, we'll have to tow her across to Liverpool. Mr. Andrews, the seagull is perfectly capable to sail under her own power. All the way across the North Sea? No, no, it must be pretty rusty by now. My ship is in as good condition as she was ten years ago when we put in this port. I know how you feel, Skipper, but if you don't mind, I'd rather play it safe. No, I don't think I made myself clear. Sir, this ship has had the finest maintenance that you find aboard any vessel. I have seen to that myself. Would you care to go below and look about, sir? Sure, why not? Then if you will follow me. Rust and corrosion, I understand. She was a beauty, all right. Her diesels reposing in gleaming silence. Her eye, a Zeiss periscope, set to scan the horizon. Her tubes ready for torpedoes. I felt a strange affinity toward this ship that to Andrews meant just so many tons of metal to be turned into X amount of dollars... While to her captain, she was a whole world of tradition. A world now coming to an end. And still, I suppose you think that the seagull should be dismantled and scrapped? Well, I'm afraid that's what we bought her for. Then may I respectfully make a last request on her behalf? I'll be happy to oblige if it's anything reasonable. Don't, don't tow her away like a crippled ship. Let me guide her on this last journey. All we need is one week, a, a skeleton crew. My services are free. I don't know. All right. I'll tell you what, Skipper. I'll check with my company and get in touch with you. Ah. Well, that sounds like a good idea to me, Andrews. You'd be saving your company quite a bit of money. My firm's allergic to taking chances. You don't take chances with a seagull. The cold logic of the dollar in the bank, not the captain's last request, persuaded the scrap middle man to take a well-calculated risk on the seagull and her master. Mr. Andrews was to accompany the ship on her final journey. I requested and was granted permission to go along and cover the voyage for my paper. It was a gray, overcast morning when we boarded the seagull. She was straining gently at her anchors with the last of the ebb tide. Help Skipper hired a decent cook. Nothing like sea air to give a man an appetite. I'm not looking forward to a picnic, Mr. Andrews. All I want is a story. You won't find it in this barge, Rawlins. But I can give you plenty of stories. My uh, company isn't averse to publicity. When we reached the bridge, we found a changed man. Captain Jan Zabados. Commander of the submarine Seagull, wearing a freshly creased uniform, windbreaker, and his well-worn battle cap. Anchor secure, sir. All engines back half. All engines back half, sir. Course, zero, zero, five. Zero, zero, five, sir. Port engine back two-thirds. Starboard engine, ahead, standard. Port engine back two-thirds, starboard engine, ahead, standard, sir. Stand by, all hands. Standing by, sir. Now, well, gentlemen, we are off. A little chilly this morning, Skipper. Perfect weather. It makes you hungry anyway. What time do we Breakfast eat? will be served in my quarters in ten minutes, Mr. Andrews. Come on down, Rollins. Let's get some chow. We had breakfast. It was better than Andrews had expected. And he was in an expansive mood when we returned to the bridge... He'd fortified himself with a thick cigar which stuck out of his mouth like a stubby finger pointed at the captain. Well, how's it going, Skipper? Passing the three-mile zone, sir. Weather seems to be clearing up. Maybe we can do a little deep-sea fishing, huh, Rollins? I have never fished from a submarine, Mr. Andrews. Sorry, gentlemen. No fishing. This is not a pleasure cruise. <laughs> That's a step, Skipper. Business before pleasure. And I agree, sir. You will leave the bridge now. Why? What's wrong? Nothing, sir. We are getting ready to submerge. So, what are you talking about? Submerge? On whose orders? My orders, Mr. Andrews. Nothing doing. That's against regulations, and you know it. 
This trip is to be made on the surface unless there's an emergency. Clear diving rudders. Diving rudders clear, sir. Did you hear what I said? Ready the tanks. Tank standing by, sir. That's enough, Sabatos. You know what the orders are. I'm not going to allow I you I must to... inform you, sir, that I am in sole command of the Seagull. I shall surrender her to no one but her rightful owner, my country. Your country? You've got no country. It's a satellite. Then of... I shall sail the seas until I have one again. You know what you're saying? That's piracy. Then, Mr. Andrews, I shall be a pirate, shan't I? Clear the deck. Diving stations. Diving stations. You're out of your mind. <laughs> Passengers below, please. Now, that's an order, Mr. Andrews. Standing by, sir. Well, I'd found my story. When we slipped beneath the surface of the North Sea, the captain let the men have rum and brandy to celebrate the seagull's return to what he called active duty. crazy. He's gone stark raving crazy. Look at the crew that madman picked himself. Well, we'll see about this. Hey, Bosun! Bosun! Come over here. Hi, sir. Know how to handle this ship? I know my job, sir. How would you like a bonus? Say $1,000. I'd like it fine, sir. All right. Take over. Never mind the captain. I'll back you up. I'm sorry, sir. He's my captain. I'm in charge of this ship. He's under my orders. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. I'm under his orders. That's how it went with the rest of the crew. They were all men without a country, handpicked by the captain, fanatically devoted to their master and the ship that was their world. In the meantime, I noticed some activity on the part of the captain and his radio operator, a constant flow of communications between the ship's wireless and her master's tiny cabin. Andrews and I went there. Come in. The captain was sitting on the bunk, poring over a chart-filled table. Mind if you and I have a little talk? I'm quite busy. Five minutes, Mr. Andrews. Thank you. Don't you think this farce has gone far enough? You'll be running out of supplies, you know, and then what? The sea is abundant with stores of all kinds, Mr. Andrews. How do you mean? I shall requisition what I need. You can't be serious. Can't I? I have guns, fore and aft, shells to go with them. Give me time, I shall obtain torpedoes as well. You'll never get away with this. That remains to be seen. My wireless has picked up the Blenheim Castle, an English freighter. We will sight her by nightfall. You're going to stop her? Exactly, Mr. Andrews. There are a few supplies that we need. I am sure her captain will oblige before continuing on his way. <laughs> We will return to escape in just a moment, but first, maybe it rained where you are today. The United States is pretty big, and it's hard for somebody on a coast-to-coast -coast network to keep track of the weather everywhere. But even if they did, remember, it's been a very dry summer. The danger of forest fires is on every hand. Please be careful with those campfires, those cigarettes, those lighted matches. And now, back to escape. Approximately eight hours later, the bosun's pipe shrilled as the seagull rose stealthily to the ocean's surface. Dead ahead in a choppy sea loomed the massive hull of the freighter Blenheim Castle, her foaming nose eerily phosphorescent, the position lights glimmering across the sea. Our searchlight reached up to her bridge with a long white finger. We clearly made out the tanker's captain standing on his bridge in a splotch of white glare, bellowing through a megaphone. Heave to! Coming alongside! Who are you? Raider! Pass a line! Raider! I won't pass a cow's tail! Where's the war? 
It is starting now. That's a bloody lie. Keep away. Ready aboard, or you will be sunk. Why, you kettle bottom, not tell her, traitor. I'll bust your kettle till you make water. Follow my orders, or I open fire. Why don't you back up and talk off? I give you three minutes. I'll give you a kick in the belly. It was incredible. Here we were at peace, and Captain Zabatos had started his own private war. He had the guns, and the tanker's captain had only his ship. Before the Seagull's gun crew could get a bearing, the tanker lurched forward, picking up speed. Wheel hard over, bent on ramming us. Our guns started to fire, blasting away at the tanker. But it kept coming on. Closer, closer. The sharp bow cutting through the choppy sea. Dive, dive, dive! We weren't fast enough. There was a grinding lurch. And we knew the seagull had been damaged in the collision with the freighter, but we couldn't tell how badly. The first realization of disaster came when we saw the captain. His hair damp with perspiration. Eyes gleaming feverishly and a face turned ashen gray. Nobody leaves his station without my orders. You gentlemen stay out of the way. I'm not going to take orders from you or anybody else. I represent the owners of this ship. You do? You heard me, Zapatos. Then tell your owner she has been rammed. I'll hold you responsible. As her commander, I accept sole responsibility for ship and crew, including you and Mr. Rawls. That's very noble, mister, but I'm a businessman. What's the extent of the damage? Conning tower smashed and the scope tube cracked. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, surface, send an SOS. I never have sent an SOS, and I never will. That's your business. I'm an American citizen, and so is Mr. Rowland. You can't hold us against our... You will be put ashore when conditions are favorable. Let me set you straight, Sabatis. If you want to go down in misery, I'm not stopping you. But you can't force me to stick around until there's tin cans full of holes. I want to get out of here. Now, I order you for the last time, surface, to signal for help. Andrews, if you wish to leave now, you may take a escape hat. You're crazy. Not at all. The damage is trifling. But since you feel so frightened of your life, I suggest that you leave. So help me. When we get out of this, I'm going to have you busted, jailed, hung if I can. Get out of my way, if you please. I have no time to discuss the matter with you. Come on, Andrews. Whose side are you on, anyway, Rollins? Nobody's. I just want to live. <laughs> The hours pass slowly at the ocean bottom. The stillness echoing the attempts of the men working to repair the damage. The air was getting foul. Breathing becoming more difficult. Storage battery's going, sir. Ah. Uh, then dim the lights, Boson. Oxygen's running low. Ration it. I've got two men in sick bay already. Sir. All right. All right. Carry on. Sir. What? What? What is it, Bosun? The men need air. It's very bad aft. All right. Very well, Bosun. We go up. All engines. Ready. All engines ready, sir. Clear pressure tanks. Clearing tanks, sir. Diving rudder. Standard. Vessels approaching overhead, sir. Ease rudder, hold tanks. Chase are closing in, sir. Request ship to ship communication. All right. I talk to them. Stand by. SS Seagull coming in. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> 
NS-127. Are you in trouble, Seagull? No trouble, sir. Surface at once. State your conditions. None. Then I regretfully refuse her. Following orders, Seagull. Come up or we drop depth charges. Do so, then. You can't get away. We've got a sonar fix on you. No surrender. We are ready with depth charges, Seagull. Wait! Get back! Wait, on the roof. There. Americans down here! We need our communications! The first depth charge was a warning. Followed by another coming closer. And another still closer. The pressure was enormous. The ship rocked from bow to stern and started to take water. Full engines! Ahead, full! Full engines ahead, full, sir. Course, zero, two, standard. Course, zero, two, standard, sir. Oh, try it, Captain. This is wrong. It can't help now. Stand out of my way, Mr. Rawlins. You're a naval officer, not a murderer. Your ship is finished. You have no right to kill your crew. And that's what it's going to mean if you don't stop. This, this is my ship. My life. Oh, you don't understand. It's still murder. Standing by for your order, sir. Well, what are you going to do? Oh. Surface. Surface! Surface! Stand by, surface! No response, sir. Tanks won't operate. All engines stop! All engines stop! Now what? I seem to have no choice, do I? Stand by to abandon ship. Abandon ship! That was almost the end of it. The sub couldn't get up to the surface. She could only go down. And the way she was taking water, it wasn't going to be long. The men lined up outside the escape chamber, and one by one, they shook hands with the captain as they moved by. You could see in his eyes what they meant to him, and in their low voices, their feelings for him. Goodbye, Captain. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Captain. Goodbye, Captain. Then it was Andrew's turn to go. The bosun is in the lock. He will give you your instructions as to how to get to the surface. I lived through this, Sapatos. I'm going to see I know, the... I know. I am sorry for the, the discomfort you have been caused. Goodbye, Mr. Andrews. Coming, coming, Rollins? Sure. You go ahead, uh, one at a time, you know. Well, good luck. And to you. Now, Mr. Rollins, huh? I imagine you would have quite a story to write for your newspaper. Well, let's forget that. It's not important. What about you? Andrews isn't kidding, you know. Once you get up I there... wonder if... Would you do me one last service? Of course. He got his log out and started to write. I looked over his shoulder as he made his last entry. All men off ship. Strong list to port. 
Storage batteries, zero. Oxygen, 20. Ship secure. Signed, Captain Jan Zabados. Commander, S.S. Sego. You oblige me by taking this log up with you. It can be fastened to your belt. Well, why don't... Why don't you carry it? There are one or two other things I must take with me. Now, look, if... The... No, Mr. Rollins, go on. I will follow you. Yes, but... Please you... go on. Okay. Hurry up, though, will you? She won't last long. I got up to the surface. A boat from the sub-chaser picked me up five minutes later. Every man of the crew and Andrews was safe. After that, we cruised about for hours, waiting, hoping that Sabatos would appear. But he didn't. I should have known he'd stay with the seagull. The skipper of the chaser understood what had happened a lot better after he'd read the log. I guess seamen have a feeling about such things. Well, that's the story. That's all there is to it. Under the direction of Anthony Ellis, Escape has brought you The Log, a story by Marianne Mosner and Francis Rosenwald, starring Lawrence Dobkin and Byron Kane. Featured in the cast were Alan Reed, Kurt Martell, Frank Gerstel, Eric Snowden, Richard Peel, and Jim Nusser. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week... You are walking the streets of an Indian city. Terrifying, sweltering streets. While the man you fear has already made his mark on you. A mark from which there can be no escape. So listen next week when Escape will bring you James Henderson's frightening story, The Untouchable. I Confess is the graphic title of tomorrow night's Lux Radio Theater film play adaptation. Cary Grant and Phyllis Thaxter co-star. You'll remember I Confess as one of Alfred Hitchcock's most su suspenseful thrillers. And you'll enjoy every minute of it on most of these same stations tomorrow night when CBS Radio presents the Lux Radio Theater. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Remember, you can hear Jack Benny every Sunday night on the CBS Radio Network.